Hey guys, welcome to another episode of In and At Home Locked Down. Today I'm installing some shiny bits. First on the list of mods is to remove the intake horn and the injector lines so that I can get to the injectors. Also have to take off the return fuel rail, which also connects to the fuel filter canister on the side of the head. Freeing the injectors is pretty simple, there's just a retaining nut holding them into the head. The lump that looks like a ball bearing is a key to prevent this injector from spinning in the cylinder head as the nozzle sprays fuel in a particular direction into the cylinder. Most of the injectors came out pretty easily, but a couple of them were seized in, forcing me to produce this tool. The tool is essentially just a length of pipe with a nut welded to a bolt and another nut used to pull against the washer, against the pipe, and to lift the injector out of the head. It's just a simple puller, really. These injectors are looking pretty scungy, so I'm setting up my nozzle tester, and I'm gonna find out whether they're any good. The tester simulates the fuel pressure that the injector pump would apply to it, and we can see both what pressure the injector cracks at and how the fuel sprays out of the nozzle. Most of the injectors had okay crack pressure, but you can see that under the crack pressure, fuel was leaking out of the nozzle. That's not supposed to happen, and that would cause black smoke, excessive consumption, and all sorts of other problems. So definitely changing the nozzles is the right way to go. Injectors are carefully taken apart, each of the parts are checked to make sure that they're okay. The nozzles are going to be replaced anyway, but I still need to reuse the spring, shim, and other internal parts, as well as the body. All of the small parts are placed onto a magnet, and the rest of them all go into an ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, these tiny little shims go in on top of the spring um, and these are an extra shim that will just increase the crack pressure slightly. Increasing the crack pressure of the injectors is said to improve throttle response. The injectors are put back together with the new shims installed as well as new nozzles. Now these are power driven diesel 5 by 12 thou nozzles so they flow more diesel than the factory ones. There are different nozzle types. These are sack nozzles. I don't really know much of the difference. These apparently are noisier but should do the job just fine. With the new nozzles and shims installed, crack pressure is checked. 4200 PSI is the target. We're also looking for a nice crisp action when the uh, injector cracks. We can see here, it's, it's a really clean, rapid snap, which is what we want. The injector bores in the cylinder head still have the copper washers in there, which I need to fish out. It is definitely a bad idea not to replace these when you're doing your injectors.
With carbon, rust and oil cleaned from the bores, I fit new copper washers and put the injectors into the cylinder head. You might notice I'm messing with the valve springs in the background. When you're waiting for parts, you can't really film everything on order, so I'll get to that a bit later on. Injector nuts are fitted, then torqued down to 44 pound-feet. Make the noise. If I have to pull the injectors again, I don't really want to be fighting with all the scunge that was in the bores last time, so I'm making sure to replace the O-rings that, that prevent that. The fuel return rail is fitted. New copper washers are used as well. The banjo bolts are torqued down between 8 and 10 pound-feet. Next mod on the list is really satisfying. The Hulset, I've nicknamed it the Chulset because it's the Chinese Cummins Turbo. Um, it's, look, it's, it is the genuine factory one, but it's not the same as the one that shipped on the US 6BTs, which means I'm just not certain that it's gonna hold the boost I wanna run. So it's gotta go. This is a power-driven diesel Aggressa 62. It has a T3 exhaust housing and a 4-inch V-band on it. They dynoed this at 538 horsepower. That had a lot of timing in it, but it also had less supporting mods than what I'm running. So that gives me a goal of, of 500 horsepower to aim for with this build. First problem I can see is that the actuator is not going to clear. There's only one thing to it, I'm gonna to have to flip the manifold. Easy. The next problem I can see is that the compressor housing is much bigger than the hull suit, so it doesn't clear the manifold. To fix this, I've got a flange, which I'm using as a spacer. Works perfectly. I have to clock the turbo, which is the process of aligning the core so that the oil feed is at the top and the drain is at the bottom so gravity can assist the flow and also aligning the compressor housing with where it needs to be. Because I'm high mounting this turbo, the original oil feed line is not going to do the job, so I need to make a new one. For anyone who's not done this before, you do need the right hose cutting tool to be able to work with braided lines, and you need the tape to prevent it from fraying when you, when you cut it. You can get these made up just by going to your local hydraulic supply store, but it is pretty easy to make them. There are plenty of how-to guides to be found on YouTube, so I won't go into too much detail. These adapter fittings are required for me to connect the feed line to the filter housing and the turbo inlet, which have M12 by 1.5 threads on them. The fittings I'm using are AN4. Once I've figured out how long I need the hose to be, I can cut it to length and attach the other fitting. The factory oil drain was wobbly and loose in the block, so this is a tapered fitting with an O-ring seal. It comes with a cap that you can use to tap into position. This provides an AN10 fitting for me to make my own oil drain. The turbo drain outlet is also AN10 and gets a matching fitting.
these are just push lock style fittings so they're they're strong enough on their own that you don't need hose clamps um, they are hard to get on so it was a lot easier with the filter removed same thing again cut the length of the cutters and done With the turbo in its final position the logo is upside down kind of a not really important thing but I flipped it anyway so one problem I thought I might have which I am having is that the turbo doesn't include the bonnet I've cut out this bit of webbing it provides just enough clearance and I don't think it's structural for the bonnet so it's only a really small piece It seems to have made just enough clearance. We'll see how that goes. Right, this is printable timing tape. You have to check the printed scale and you have to make sure you put the diameter of your harmonic balancer in correctly. I've set the engine to top dead center and I'm removing the P-pump. I have a set of 4K governor springs to put in. While I've got the pump out, I'm also going to replace this tappet cover, which turns out it leaks. The peep pump has two packs of springs inside it. You access them under this cover. You have to rotate the pump so that you can see the spring packs. It's pretty straightforward to replace them, but you do have to be careful not to drop anything into the pump. This retaining nut has notches on the back of it and it's held in place by the spring tension of the governor springs. I've measured the protrusion of the stud from the end of the nut and we'll make sure when it goes back together that the protrusion is the same. There's three inner springs I need to remove and replace and one outer spring that controls the idle that I'll be leaving alone. Depending on which model of engine you're dealing with, there's some shims underneath and on top. Mine only has shims underneath to remove. There's also a spring land at the bottom that has to come out and is replaced by the, by the one that's part of the governor spring kit. Factory retainer goes back in and then the retaining nut is done up to the required tension. The pump is rotated to access the other spring pack, which are then replaced, and then once again, done up to the correct tension using the measurement. While I'm here, the intake is also going to get some TLC. I'm going to remove the grid heater from it, fit a new gasket, and give it a lick of paint. This is the new tappet cover. It's billet aluminium, uses an O-ring seal instead of the factory style, which doesn't seal very well. It has two breathers in it as well, so I'll need to get some fittings to suit. P-pump goes back on. I'm also setting the timing this time to 18 degrees. Factory position is 13.5. I reset the top dead center flag. If I don't remove that, it'll snap off. And yes, I painted the P-pump silver. Because I've upgraded the governor springs, I can rev the engine higher, which means the valves could float and be closed by the pistons. That's bad, so I need to upgrade the valve springs. Do 
You know what's super not fun? When you've taken your engine away from top dead center because you were doing the timing and you forgot about it and you took one of the valve stem seals off and the valve dropped into the cylinder head. That's sick. I've had the injector off and I'm poking down there with a piece of wire um, to try and get the valve to sit directly under the the bore for the valve and then I can turn the engine back to top dead center and push it back up through. <laughs> what the fuck? Victory! Oh yeah. There were some hours of my day I did not need wasted. With the valve springs out of the way, it's the perfect time to also replace the stem seals. These are 60 pound valve springs from Power Driven Diesel. I'm using the factory retainers and locks. These locks are a tapered fit and just hold in position by the pressure of the valve spring. I'm being extra careful to make sure that they're in position properly because if they come out, I could have a fuel mixture that is rich in valves. That would be bad. make the noise I don't know if it was a bad idea to take a bolt out of each cylinder head um, but I had to do it to remove the rockers so we'll see how it goes right now I'm just adjusting the valve lash 20 thou for the exhaust valves 10 thou for the intake while I'm here might as well do something about these scungy valve covers Ah yes, a whole day of sanding was just what I felt like doing. With the valve covers looking resplendent in Chevy Orange, the next job is delivery valves. You do need a special socket for these. The old delivery valves are removed. Check the bores to make sure they're clean and there's no schmutz in there. And the new delivery valves go in. These are Power Driven Diesel 025 delivery valves. I don't know what that number is. Maybe it's a dimension, inches or something. And a new O-ring goes under the holder. I lube it up before putting it back into the hole.
The delivery valves get torqued in two stages to 25 and then 85 pound feet. These Welsh plugs or freeze plugs if you prefer are known for blowing out under high RPM. Mine were actually in there crooked so I've got some power driven diesel billet freeze plugs. Uh, these use an o-ring to seal and they, they bolt in so they can't come out. This is a 14-in-1 sensor gizmo gauge from Just Race Parts. This is the coolant sensor going into the head. We've also got an air intake sensor, oil pressure sensor, gearbox temp sensor, uh, boost sensor, exhaust gas temperature sensor, everything, everything you could want. Moment of truth. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a leak from the return rail. This one was brand new from Cummins, also fitted it again with new washers. Leak solved. Well thanks for watching guys. Um, I tried something a bit new with the voiceovers and no music, so let me know whether you thought that was better or worse than what I've otherwise been doing, um, and stay tuned. Smash that like and subscribe, and if you want notifications for a new episode, hit that bell icon as well. Take care.